All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning and evening to those joining us from across the globe. Welcome to the Interfaith Harmony Week discussion and forum. My name is Naria Gorder, and I am the National Program Coordinator for Youth and International Association of Youth and Students for Peace, also known as IAYSP or YSP. We are one of your co-hosts for this event today. So today's online discussion is to recognize World Interfaith Harmony Week, which happens every year in the first week of February. This is an opportunity for each and every one of us to celebrate our diversity and commonality between our different faiths and beliefs. World Interfaith Harmony Week, also WIHW, conceived to promote a culture of peace and nonviolence was first proposed by King Abdullah II of Jordan at the United Nations in 2010. This was quickly adopted by the UN General Assembly declaring the first week of February each year as World Interfaith Harmony Week, calling on governments, institutions, and civil society to observe it with various programs and initiatives that would promote the aim of the WIHW objectives. Recognizing the imperative need for dialogue among different faiths and religions to enhance mutual understanding, harmony, and cooperation among people, the General Assembly encourages all states to spread the message of interfaith harmony and goodwill in the world's churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and other places of worship during that week on a voluntary basis and according to their own religious traditions or convictions. Our theme for today's event is religion's role in the world. We have two wonderful guest speakers today representing Islam and Hinduism. During this live stream, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and we'll try our best to have them answered. We just ask you to please be respectful and considerate of what you post in the chat. I would like to now introduce our co-hosts and mo moderators for this event, Sunmi Iwasaki and Stephanie Diaz from Dinner Table Talk, a podcast project put together by these two young ladies because they saw a need for an increase in civic engagement with the youth of today. The goal of their podcast is to empower listeners to connect and with local service projects and nonprofit organizations, as well as allow each guest speaker to share about their organization and work to create a network platform for speakers and listeners. And I'll be adding some more information and links for their podcast in the chat um, very soon. So now I'm going to hand it over to Sunmi and Stephanie, and they'll be introducing our speakers for today. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sunday. Today is the official last day of Interfaith Harmony Week. My name is Stephanie Diaz, and I am one of the co-moderators for today, along with my friend, Sunmi Iwasaki. And before we begin, of course, I'd like to go over uh, just a little bit about who we are, as Naria was mentioning before. Our mission statement for the podcast that we have, which is called Dinner Table Talk, is connecting people for the purpose of strengthening civic life is our goal. At the core joint of our efforts is the belief that every person has the ability to help their community and country thrive. And so we felt that this is an amazing opportunity to get behind, especially it being Interfaith Harmony Week. And... I'd like to pass it on to Sunmi to tell us what we did throughout the week on social media. Absolutely, thank you, Stephanie. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sunmi and this past week we were able to collaborate with YSP USA and post you know, various organizations, various religions on the social media pages. Um, and so make sure you guys check it out there for some of the um, world, uh, you know, our, our major faiths around the world. <clears throat> but more importantly, what we're doing was uh, through the, the networking of YSP, as well as UPF and ACLC, our uh, other affiliate organizations, uh, we were able to contact two amazing individuals who we are going to introduce in sh a short moment. And through that, promote the Interfaith Harmony Week and come to understand the value of it as a young, as young individuals or young people too, and kind of personally sparked uh, this passion, I think, in dinner table talk to kind of want to get the get this out to our listeners too, or 
address address it, address this and introduce this to the young people up there as well. So should I uh I don't know, do you want to add anything else, Stephanie? Otherwise, you know, we're gonna be introducing our speakers. Yeah, that was perfect. I say let's get into uh introducing our guest speaker. So as Cindy mentioned, we have two amazing individuals gathered with us today. Cindy, let's go let's go through their biographies actually so our audience can get to know them just a little bit more before they introduce themselves as well. Sounds perfect. So first I'd actually like to introduce uh, our representative for the Islamic community. His name is Imam Shamsi Ali, Imam is his title. And Imam Ali is a well-known religious scholar and interfaith bridge builder in New York and beyond. He currently leads the Jamaica Muslim Center, which is the largest Muslim community center in New York City. He is also the founder and president of Nus Antada Foundation, a nonprofit focusing on building peace and harmony between people of all backgrounds. He is also the founder of the first Islamic boarding school in America. Imam Ali is known as a moderate face of Islam and had been awarded largely for his tireless efforts to build understanding and cooperation between peoples of religions, such as Ambassador for Peace by the Interreligious Federation in 2002 and the Ellis Island Honor Award in 2009, which is the highest non-military award presented to an immigrant in the United States. Imam Ali travels the world to lecture and is a frequent speaker at the United Nations and has appeared on both national and international media outlets, including CNN, Fox News, NBC, Al Jazeera, and many others. Wonderful. And I guess I guess I get to introduce our second speaker. Yes. All right, everybody. Um, so our next, uh, our, our second guest speaker today, we have Sadvihi Bhagawati Saraswati. She has uh, she she has a she has a PhD and is a renowned spiritual leader in India. She is president of Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education and empowerment to women and children. She is Secretary General of Global Interfaith WASH Alliance, W-A-S-H, launched by UNICEF, the first alliance of religious leaders for water, sanitation, and hygiene. They have a website as well, so make sure to check it out. Uh, Sadvihi is also director of the world famous, <clears throat> excuse me, International Yoga Festival. Originally from Los Angeles and a graduate of Stanford University, Sadvihi has lived at Paramount, uh, Paramarth Nikitan Rishikesh in the Himalayas for 24 years, where she gives spiritual discourses, the satsang and meditation, and leads a lot of humanita humanitarian programs. And here we have them. Welcome. If we can ask for you both Welcome to unmute please. your microphones. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we welcome you. We welcome you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for responding to our, our hopes to put this on. It's amazing. And I know both of you actually had um, actually other meetings and services and to talk to and such. So, so honored to have both of you come on today. Sure. Anytime. Wow. I, I mean, I think that was the bio was just like a snippet of, you know, what you've accomplished. Let's hear from, you know, the, both of you, <clears throat> excuse me, both of you as to, you know, who you are a little bit more. Um, let's who should we go? So we have, so if you could, I guess, yeah. yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about what you do and why you're here, why you are here, of course, and, and maybe uh, two minutes and yeah, maybe we can start with um, Imam Ali. All right, let me first thank you for this opportunity. It's such an honor to join um, uh, Savi Bhagavati for this honorable uh, uh, discussion. 
uh, on this very important day of interfaith, uh, with interfaith harmony week at the United Nations. Um, my name is Imam Shamsi Ali. Imam is a title, means leader. So we are leader of the community. Um, and I'm originally from Indonesia. I've been here in the state for the last over two decades now. I'm always New Yorker. So <laughs> it is difficult to leave New York, you know, because I feel like lonely when I, uh, every, go, I, I, every time that I go anywhere, I feel like lonely. So I came from the largest Muslim country in the world, as you may know, that Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, we have over 200 million Muslims in the country. Uh, one of the stereotypical uh, minds in some uh, that Muslims means Arabs, which is the reality is the Arab is only 15 to 18 percent of all Muslims worldwide. And so I came from Indonesia and I, to be honest with you, before I came to the United States, I'd never, almost I'd never met any Muslims in my life. So let me just mention this very brief story. When I came to New York for the first time, I was renting a house in Astoria, Queens, and my neighbor was, an, was a, a Catholic from uh, uh, Nor Northern Ireland. He's an Irish Catholic. And every morning he went out from his house cleaning his driveway and mine too. You know, instead of appreciating him, I developed suspicion what he wanted to do with me. You know, that, that is a type of thing that we had, okay? But you know what, weeks, months, he never talked about religion. It is me who basically realized that he taught me how to be a good Muslim. The religion is not what you do in the houses of worship only. Yes, it's important to do worship, but basically what we show to the people around us, it's about human character, it's about behavior. So he taught me to change, that in order for you to be considered a religious, show to the people your character. And the language of our Christians and Jewish friends, love your God with all your heart and minds, and love your neighbors with all, you, with all your hearts. And that's what we have to do as peoples of religion. So that's me briefly, just two minutes only. Shortest two minutes ever. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go to. That says a lot. That says a lot about um, faith leaders and what does it mean to be a religious person. Yeah, so currently I'm leading the Jamaica Muslim Center. Jamaica is an area in New York City. And our community is considered the largest uh, Muslim community in New York City. So we have like over 2,000 on Friday congregations and our annual gatherings have over 10,000 people. Uh, so it is located in Jamaica area. Uh, as you know, that Queens is the most diverse county or, or borough in the world. So we have everyone here and that's where we are learning to be a good neighbor to one another. That's right. Definitely. I am from Queens myself. <laughs> I oh, live in okay. Queens. I am in Queens oh, right now. <laughs> so yes, thank you, you Imam Ali. Sure. Thank you. And now well, I'd like to pass yeah. it on to, to uh, uh, Sadbi. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you're here, what you do and why you're here. Well, for me, it's really been about grace. The, the title, beginning as my, my imam brother shared, the, the name includes the title. So Sadvi is the female of the renunciant tradition in the Hindu tradition. So for men, we use the word Swami. And for women, they use the word sadhvi or swamini either way. And it's those of us who have chosen to live the path of monasticism, the renunciant life, the life that, you know, people talk about you've left everything. And yet for me, it's been an experience of actually gaining everything. So yes, you leave the concept of a family. It's vows of simplicity, vows of celibacy, vows of non-ownership and devotion to God. But what you get in that experience of living a life immersed in divine connection, living a life immersed in devotion, immersed in service, is such an extraordinary blessing and an extraordinary gift. I 
grew up in California, in Los Angeles. I graduated from Stanford University and was in the midst of doing a PhD in psychology when I traveled to India with a backpack on just a semester off of school, having no idea, no intention, no inclination that my life was about to be transformed. But that was the divine plan. And I stood on the banks of the sacred Ganga River and had such a powerful, powerful spiritual transformation experience that I knew this is where I need to be. So that was just almost 25 years ago. And it's been such a blessing because the world that I grew up in was really a world focused on me. What can I earn? What can I attain? What can I achieve? What can I buy? What can I own? What can I have? What can I do? Just all about me. And the world that I was so blessed to be brought into, the spiritual world, was a world about what threw me rather than what for me, it's what threw me. So what, what service can my brain, my hands, my legs, my mouth, my time, my talent, what service can I be a, a vehicle for, an instrument of? And so I have been very blessed to be able to serve in innumerable ways. I'm the Secretary General of our Global Interfaith WASH Alliance, which is an organization that brings religious heads of all the different major religions together for water, sanitation, and hygiene. And I'm president of our Divine Shakti Foundation dedicated to women and children and education. And I do a beautiful, blessed amount of spiritual teaching, meditation teaching, satsang, spiritual question and answer sessions. And lastly, it's just been been such a blessing as I began by saying it's it's grace to be able to be used in such a way as a tool, as this instrument for grace to flow through. And I feel very much like the first beneficiary of that. And then the fact that it overflows so much to benefit others is a beautiful, beautiful bonus. Yeah. Wow. The way you just explained it went in depth of, of, you know, what is it that you're, who you are and how this journey started. I could feel, Stephanie, I think you two probably like, we just, I think, I hope the audience feels that too, like they're being enriched with this knowledge, but also this insight into this life of spirituality. Thank you so much. I know that, uh, Unfortunately, you would have to leave earlier, right? Is that correct? Um, you won't be able to stay for the whole forum today. Oh, <laughs> unfortunately. I'll stay on. I'll stay on as long as I can. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but though, to those who are listening, you know, if you have questions, or I don't in social media, also the responses you guys had were so great. I hope we can like reiterate that here on the comment section and hopefully we get to being able to address them with our wonderful speakers today. And okay. well, Kasumi, why don't we, uh, we lead them into the first question for today? Our first question, it's, well, it's, we all know it's Interfaith Harmony Week, right? Um, and I, I just want to ask like, and today's the last day it's, it was from the uh, 1st of February to the 7th of February. And I just want to know what does interfaith harmony mean to you, you guys? Uh, what does it look like, feel like, taste like? What is it like to live that? Um, let's, this time, let's start with our dear uh, Sadvihi Bhagawati to sure. share as well. 
So to me, interfaith harmony is, it's an interesting irony in a way, because on the one hand, it's very beautiful. It's very wonderful. I've been very blessed to be part of a variety of events this week, but also for so many years, a part of so many interfaith programs. My guru, Pooja Swami Chidananda Saraswati Ji, has been deeply engaged in interfaith work for many, many decades. So on the one hand, it's beautiful. We love it. It's powerful. And yet on the other hand, it's almost tragic that it even has to exist at all because, you know, we don't have to have fora bringing together people who like different types of pizza, right? I mean, if you went out with a bunch of friends to a pizzeria and one person said, well, I want it with the sausages. And the other one said, well, I'm a vegetarian. So, you know, only vegetables for me. And someone says, well, I'm a vegan. So, you know, just the crust and the tomato. And then someone else says, well, you know, I'm gluten-free and a vegan. So just give me, you know, a bowl of tomato sauce and a spoon. You would you wouldn't need to have a forum to reconcile those positions. We would be able amidst a group of friends with very, very varying, not just culinary tastes, but whole moral and ethical viewpoints around what we eat. But nonetheless, we'd be able to come together at a table of friends and have a meal full of love and friendship and camaraderie. And we wouldn't need mediators to help us work out the fact that, you know, we eat differently. And it seems to me actually quite tragic that this entire world of interfaith dialogue even needs to exist. It seems like, well, okay, in the same way that we have different views about what we eat, we have different views about what's considered acceptable to wear, right? I mean, I remember in school, going to school and girls would show up in certain clothes that if I tried to get out of the house and that, my parents would be like, what do you think you're wearing? You know, and yet again, we don't need fora to bring together different styles of dressing or different, sty different ways of understanding what's considered appropriate attire. We have this sort of community sense of agree to disagree. Everybody is allowed to have their own flavor of food, of dressing, of how you live. Mm. And yet we all get along. Now, we may not necessarily be best friends. I may have a particular viewpoint around some of that that prohibits me from being besties with someone who's got the exact opposite viewpoint. But that doesn't mean that we wouldn't be able to get along, to be friends, to certainly be members of the same community working together harmoniously. And yet somehow when it comes to this concept of how we worship, how we think of God and our relationship to God, we're not even able to be in the same country together let alone around the same table together without mediators and intermediaries and people working to help us have dialogue. So again, it's beautiful to be able to have these dialogues and yet I hope that a day comes where we're able to see different religious views really as just that. We differ. We differ in so many areas. We are a beautiful variety of so many different walks of life and tastes and belief systems. And that's beautiful. And to be able to appreciate that garden of variety rather than fighting so much to make others like us that we need to actually have mediators come in for dialogue. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the word you use was it's tragic. It's <clears throat> it's unfortunate to have to have a forum to talk about it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. People are willing to come together. But it's on the other hand, it makes us think, oh, 
Like, why do we need that? Why, wh what is it that causes that kind of conflict? I mean, and I saw um, our um, Imam Ali just nodding his head too, even, I mean, also just to know, I don't know if Facebook Live sees all of our interactions or all of our screens, maybe it's just the people who's talking, but when the two of you came on, when Imam Ali um, acknowledged your entrance and you guys shared your bios, you know, gave your bios, like the familiarity you guys had with each other and the respect that I felt from you guys was just, it was very subtle, but I really admired that. And maybe it's because you guys have been working at this interfaith harmony concept or to make it a reality or I, I don't know what it is, but um, may I hear from, can we hear from Imam Ali to just, you know, what does interfaith yeah. harmony mean? Yeah. So let me first, you know, truly thank um, and appreciate um, uh, Stadvi for such philosophical, very deep way of uh, defining uh, the importance of this interfaith harmony. Um, and I think that's what it is. The essence of this uh, effort, if I may call it effort, is to come to the essence of our religiosity uh, by acknowledging the existence of differences that we have. So let me go back to my own self. Um, you know, um, as I said, I was born in Indonesia, and then I, I went to Pakistan to pursue my higher Islamic studies during the invasion of Soviet Union, Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And I was a relatively very young, you can imagine in my 20th, um, you know, living in an area which is close to uh, war. So how that society basically shaped my um, mindset, uh, ideas of things in life. It's not easy as a young person at the time. And then I was then invited to the United States to be an imam uh, after living in Saudi Arabia for two years. And you can imagine once again, Saudi Arabia is a country which is very exclusive. And, and, and finally, I landed in New York City in, in 1996. And just after five years, 9-11 happened. And I truly felt being betrayed in one hand. But on the other hand, I felt that I was embraced by almost everyone. You know, I felt, you know, the blessings uh, of, of being among a part of these uh, American fabric society uh, where Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, all of them came together around us and tried to overcome the challenge that we faced at the time. And, and it was the beginning of my interaction with my uh, non-Muslim friends, with Christians, with Jews, Hindus, Buddhists. And I was invited by the New York City mayor to represent the Muslim community in too many, many occasions including accompanying the then President Bush going down for the first time to the ground zero. And then I was the one who represented the Muslim at the national prayer at the Yankee Stadium, for example. It was the first interaction with my non-Muslims. And I still remember uh, when, as you know that particularly between Muslims and Jews, there is a, um, a, a, an issue that is sometime beyond our comprehension, uh, particularly because of the Middle Eastern issue. Uh, and at that time when I was, I was sitting there in the um, host, how you call that, the waiting room to be called into the stage, uh, a rabbi came to me and he said, are you from Indonesia? I said, yes, I am. And he said, I like Indonesia. I said, why? He said, because I have a friend in Indonesia. And then he mentioned my teacher. This is my teacher, uh, who was a, uh, the, the former president of Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid Gusdur, who was a blind president, basically. And so I, I felt that he embraced me. So let me just go to, to, the, to the real answer. Number one, because interfaith harmony basically is an attempt to, to bring us best into our real essence of humanity. We have to understand there is only one essence of our humanity. There is only one humanity. There are many human beings, but there's only one humanity. Okay, so we have to understand that the tendency of being divisive and dividing ourselves into different sections with different, you know, whatever it might be, is, 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 a, is a betrayal to the essence of that humanity. And that's why interfaith harmony is one of the many ways to come back to that platform as one humanity. And, and it's very, very important. The other thing is that interfaith harmony, I think, is a, a great reminder that originally we came from the same family. There's only one human family under God. Can you, can you say that? And there's a verse in the Holy Quran, and I'm sorry to quote this. It says, all mankind, we created you from a male and a female. 
and you made you into many nations and tribes so that you get to know one another. Now in Arabic language, getting to know one another, called ta'aruf. And the word ta'aruf is not only to know the name, but deeper than that. It is about knowing the culture, the belief, the traditions, uh, what he likes in terms of food, as uh, Sadib talk about the food. You know, we have to know our brothers and sisters around us. And so that we can come to the same feeling that what they feel is what we feel. What they aspire and wish in life, that's what we aspire and, live and wish in life. Because we have the same thing, we have the same feelings. So we are one family, but then be made by God into many nations and tribes. In, in other words, that we have diversity. That diversity is, must not be a ground to be divisive, to hate, to even fight one another, but to know one another. So at the end of the day, interfaith harmony must bring us together, come back to our original humanity. And I think that is one of the most important uh, purpose of interfaith harmony. Wow. I, I'm so amazed actually um, by both of your definitions you hear when me? it comes to, yes, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> no. um, I, I'm actually very amazed and inspired by your definitions of what interfaith harmony means to you. And, and of course, in perspective to uh, both of your faiths and uh, as, as the conversation is flowing, uh, as you know, the theme for, for our uh, event today is religion's role in the world. Uh, so the theme for our forum is religion's role in the world. And the founders of IAYSP, the late Reverend Sam Young Moon and his wife, Dr. Hach Han Moon, have specifically called many times on, on different religions to come together and work together to bring about peace. So where uh, both of you mentioned uh, uh, I, I'd like uh, Sadvi's, um, uh, what is it, metaphor on the pizza, right? It's very, and actually for a lot of young people, they might be able to understand and relate, right? So that's, that's very good. So do you think, and this was actually one of the questions that someone from social media asked, do you think religion is necessary for peace? Because this is Interfaith Harmony Week, and the theme for this forum is religion's role in the world. So the question being, do you think religion is necessary for peace? And what do you think the significance of your religion, your faith is when it comes to that you know, world peace? Uh, what are your perspective? What are your thoughts? So I'd like to first pass it on to Sadvi to answer. So, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a beautiful, it's such a wonderful question. I'm just taking a moment to Please. think in the question because there's so many important parts actually of it and especially how it relates to your theme of religion's role in the world. I think let us, let us go like this. If we define peace only as the political cessation of violence, the political cessation of wars across boundaries of country, is religion necessary? Of course not. All that is necessary is a simple humility of being that simply says, I would rather be at peace than have a little bit more land. Just a simple cost benefit analysis that says, whatever piece of land, whether I call it my land that they're stealing or whether I'm taking something that they say is theirs, but I want to have it either way. If I have simply the common sense awareness that human life, whether it's our soldiers, an army, whether it's civilians, is not worth that piece of land, then we have peace. So religion is not necessary for that. What's needed for that is simply humility of being to take a moment and to be able to get out of the box that says what I want, when I want it, how I want it. 
to get out of the box of my power and my prestige, my prosperity and being prepared to let thousands and in many cases, hundreds of thousands of young people die in fighting a war so that I can have more land or more resources or more power. So religion is not needed for that. What's needed for that is just what I think we could collectively agree upon are virtues of good human beings, humility, generosity, compassion, the ability to, to weigh the value of human life. And yet the only definition of peace is not a cessation of violence across borders of country. The real peace that we need is so much bigger than that. So staying on the logistic and external for just a moment, and then we'll go internal, is we actually know that so many more people die every year from lack of clean water than from all forms of violence combined. So you take wars, you take terrorism, you take all forms of violence, add them together, and the sum total still pales in comparison to the number of people who are suffering and dying simply due to lack of safe and sufficient water. So our definition of peace, again, even still external, has to include access to clean water, access to clean air, access to clean soil. We could go a step further access to human rights, right? Can we actually call a society peaceful if everybody's subjugated and oppressed just because they're not actually being killed? Of course not. We would all again agree that that society is what we would call an oppressive regime. That's not peace. So again though, I wouldn't say religion is required. Again, simply what's required are the virtues of being a good human being, non-oppression of others, non-subjugation of others. You know, in yoga, the, the core of yoga, and I won't go into this in any kind of detail because we don't have time, but the core of yoga is what are referred to as the yamas and the niyamas. And it's kind of the do's and don'ts, or you could think about it as the 10 commandments of a of a yogic life, but they have nothing to do with religion. They are things like nonviolence and truthfulness and not stealing and not hoarding and having integrity in our relations. And so again, in the same way, when we look at peace in our societies, religion isn't required for that. What's required is virtues of a good human being. Then we go to the next and final for the purpose of this, this short answer, the third stage of peace, which actually is our internal peace. And that's the only place that peace can really be sustained because both of the first two levels depend upon who's in power. You have someone sitting in power who is what we would term a good human being and they're going to make those good choices that will eliminate conflict, that will provide what is needed to sustain life in a healthy and peaceful way. But then you get a new leader who may not subscribe to the same virtues, and then your peace is shattered. So the only way to really have peace in a sustainable way is for the individuals of that society or of that nation or of that world to experience peace within themselves. So that if I'm in peace inside, it doesn't matter what you say to me or do to me, I'm not going to react in violence. I'm not going to harm you or oppress you or subjugate you because I'm in peace inside. And that's where I would start to say that faith plays a key role. Now, does it have to be a systematic religion 
in which everything is written up ne neatly and nicely in a book or a group of books? No. But I do think that a connection to a creator, a connection to what I call the capital P planner, a connection to the consciousness, the connection of the universe is really essential in order to find internal peace. Because if I'm not connected, if I'm all alone and it's all about me, that's not a very peaceful way to live. The real peace is found in knowing that I have been created by divinity of divinity, that the presence of that divinity exists within me. And that when I look around and I look at different people of different colors, of different sizes, of different shapes, of different sexual orientations, of different ways of life, that I'm able to see that same presence of the divinity within them. And that internal experience of peace is, I think, something that requires faith. It requires a connection to something bigger than myself, higher than myself, an expanded sense of myself, and something that connects me to the creator and the creation, whether we call it soul, spirit, consciousness, divinity, whatever word we use. But I do think that that's required for the internal peace, which becomes the sustainable peace in our world, that people who are in peace inside are going to be peaceful leaders. We're going to create companies that not only are peaceful for their employees, but actually that bring sustainability onto the earth, that bring peace onto the earth rather than leaving trails of cancer and disease and destruction wherever they go. So I think it depends on what our definition is, but I do think that at the highest and deepest level, spirituality and faith is certainly required, but a, a system of dogma isn't necessarily required. Wow, and I, I, I'd i like to start off by saying, I'm first of all, so grateful that this, be, this is being recorded live on Facebook because I can definitely go back and, and, and take a, a listen to, to your answer again and again, because actually, yeah, I completely 100% agree um, I really like that you split it into two, the physical and the internal, right? The external or the internal where externally peace, you know, if we can all be uh, human, good human beings with good values, right? To care for one another, that externally uh, is, is peace, yes, but internally it really is is having this connection, uh, whether it's it's with the creator or, or our conscience, right? Um, that internally, individually will give us peace so I thank you so much and I, I'd really like to ask the same question to Imam Ali um, do you think religion is necessary for peace uh, what do you think the significance of of your religion your faith the way you practice it uh, is when it comes to world peace what I'm going to do is to take on the very important point that Sati mentioned about it depends on how you defined uh of your definition of the religion, what does it mean for you? Um, so let me um, begin by uh, quoting a verse from the Quran that challenged directly to the peoples of religion. The Quran says, come to the same platform. And that platform is that we shall worship none but God. Now, when the Quran says, shall we worship none but God, it means it addresses to the claim religion or religiosity by, by some, but in fact, they are not religious. What does it mean? You see some people are pretending to be so religious, but in fact, they are away from religion. What does it mean to be religious? 
that's what spirituality is all about. It's all, it's all about faith. It's all about God the Almighty. So the Quran wanted to remind us that instead of worshiping your affiliations, worshiping the dogmas, as Sabi mentioned, come to the real worship. And that worship is worshiping the Almighty God. And when it comes to the worship of Almighty God, it means that we're enhancing our spirituality. And that enhancement of spirituality means that will beautify our human character. Peace, humbleness, being friendly, being kind, cheerfulness, all these are part of our human character. And these human characters are, are built on that spirituality. So religion basically has given, has been given to us, not as a means to be even mean to the people, but a means for us to be kind to the people. And therefore, I don't see the, um, the contradiction between being a religious, if we just religious in the right term, then being kind. Peace and religion must be in line. Supposedly, the more we are religious, the more we are peaceful. That is the ideals. Let's take, for example, what Christianity says, for example, take the Christianity and love your God with all your heart and mind, it says in the Bible, it means you have to have a strong faith in God, but then it doesn't stop and love your neighbors as yourselves. The Quran says that we have to believe, we have to have faith in God, trust God. God is the controller. God is everything. He is the creator. He is the one who is nourishing us, who is the one who is giving anything that we need. But at the same time, the Quran said that you have be kind to your God as uh, be kind to other people around as you are kind to God. So in other words, that religion for me is a means. It depends on how you use it. It depends on how you see it. It depends on how, how, how we define it. And, and, and I think uh, the, the key word here is education, that we have to educate our people, the people who are claim to be the followers of any religion. Because unfortunately, religion has been deeply mis mis misperceived because of the mispractice of some. You know, some people say, oh, no, religion has created wars. Those people who hate religion, they create wars too. Those people who claim to be communists, they don't believe in any faith tradition, they also kill others. So it's not about, it's about how do you understand it. So for me, religion is, 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 is a, a teaching that teaches me to build all the ideals that start dimension, how to strengthen our spirituality, how to have God in your heart. And the Quran, for example, start to mention that if you have that someone who is the P, the planner, you have that connection. Similarly, what the Quran says, Allah bi dhikrillahi, sorry in Arabic, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innil qulub, that by remembrance of God, you are going to experience a tremendous peace and tranquility. So this is the same concept. So in other words, Coming back again, it depends on how you define that religion and how you use it, how you use it. Now, why that religion is important if we humans can do it for ourselves? No, we have to understand also, we have to acknowledge also, we, we have a lot of shortcomings. We are weak, we have weaknesses. That's why we need God to help us. And one of the, the blessings, and, and there's a part of God's love that he sent down the holy books, you know, as direction as guidance for us to follow, but not to, not to manipulate it. So again, coming back to the same point that I underlined in the beginning, it depends on how you define it, depends how you understand it, and how you do it. I think it's, it's more into your education. How, how do you understand your religion and how do you follow it? Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Ali, for answering. And, and that's definitely true. It's it's the the more the more we are religious or pursue this this uh, religious practice and faith, right? The more we are closer to this concept of peace. But it really takes first individually asking ourselves, what is peace to me? What is the definition of true peace? And and I thank you both for answering those questions so well. And and again, I cannot express enough. 
how grateful I am for technology, especially within this time of, of us being in the pandemic. And I mean, there are so many people watching on, on Facebook Live and asking many questions as well. And we'd really like to, to touch upon some of them. Uh, I'd like to pass it on to Sunmi if, if you have any questions from the audience or uh, in general. They're really good. I feel like if I were able to have conversations with the audience and stuff, it's like conversation we would have as like friends, right? Because we all co come from different faith backgrounds and it takes so much time to just focus in if you're a religious person, even on your own personal faith. But um, I don't know. I think my, actually my, a question that's coming up, it's not the specific question asked by the audience. It's more like to you two, is there any, you know, I'm saying it in public. So <laughs> I'm asking this in public. Is it possible to have some kind of like a follow-up session or, um, you know, like maybe in the near future, maybe we'll do like a live thing on uh, like Instagram and ask the questions that the audience have asked, you know, because they want to know, it seems like our audience want to know things, you know, because within each major religions and faith, there's like the, uh, it's sometimes there's like, the, uh, I wouldn't say divisions, but it's like split up into different uh, theologies as well or teachings and the, and even terms like the, like, what is the, what does it, what's, uh, I can't even pronounce it, zakat, 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 yeah, zakat. Charity. Yeah. Charity. yeah, exactly, so those terminologies to help us understand more in depth as to what even you two were speaking of today, you know, so I don't know, is it possible to have, absolutely, like, yes, absolutely, yes, yes. Oh, right. Maybe it wouldn't be as, you know, um, structured as this, but we'll just have like the live comments coming in and out and it could be a conversation. Okay, hopefully, because there is a lot and even our team is faltering through them. But um, yeah, hear that guys, we can have follow ups next time. So please keep going back and forth with the questions go back on this um, streaming too to kind of like uh, uh, stimulate even more questions that you've always wondered. Great, then last final question, wrap this up, maybe two minutes per, per speaker today is, you know, we all know that this past year is really tough for a lot of people. And I personally feel as though, maybe I'm being a little biased because I'm a young person or whatnot, but for the young generation, right? I think this is something we've never experienced in our lifetime. Um, I'm thinking 25 and under, you know, and what, you know, we experience things, right? I don't even have to say about the pandemic, the environmental crisis, the social unrest, right? What would you recommend to the young people? Um, whatever that means in your mind, also young people, when you hear that, you know, what can we, what can we do? Or what do you recommend for us to maintain our, our inner harmony or peace, um, during this time? Great, great. I would say connection and courage and curiosity. So number one, stay connected within yourself. The pandemic in any case has made us do that. It's prevented us from going out and connecting with others. Of course, we have these ways of connecting through the, the technology, but basically we've all been sent inward. And I have such a deep faith in the divine plan that I know whatever lessons we're being taught, we're being taught for a reason. So connection within, find that presence of the divine Whatever that means for you, it doesn't have to have a name, it doesn't have to have a face, it doesn't have to have a form, but find that presence of the divine within yourself in the same way that the presence of the tree is in the seed, in the same way that the presence of all of it is within just a piece. So that presence of the entire divine within yourself, find that. And then curiosity. When you find yourself frustrated, upset, angry, annoyed, 
instead of being frustrated, angry, annoyed by it, instead of being in the waves of your emotions, just be interested by it. Imagine that you were sitting on the cliff overlooking an ocean rather than being tossed around by the waves. So you can look at it. Ah, there's a wave of anger. Ah, there's a wave of violence taking place in the community near me. Ah, there is a wave of unrest. There is a wave of a social media trend in a certain direction. I don't need to jump into that wave and lose myself. I can be simply interested in it. I can watch it. I can understand it. And then I can decide whether to sit here peacefully on the cliff watching it or whether it is something that makes sense for me to engage with, whether it's an internal emotional state or whether it's an external movement. But whatever I do, I do it consciously rather than being swept up by that wave. And lastly, courage. You are the ones, your generation more so than really probably any generation ever, where what our world needs from you is not individual skills. We've got artificial intelligence, we've got robots, pretty much anything that any of us can do within the next few years, there's gonna be a robot that can do it better. So for the first time perhaps in history, what we need from you is not individual skills, but we need you to be open to that intelligence of the universe, of what is supposed to flow through you. Because we have no idea what the problems will be, we have no idea what the technology that's available will be, but you, you all are the technology and you just need to stay courageous. And lastly, the word courage, and I love this, the word courage is rooted in the same root as the French word for heart, which is cur. So courage is not about protecting myself from you. Courage is about opening my heart. So with that open heart, connected to yourself, connected to the divine, connected to the creator, curious about yourself and the world around you, stay open and know that the intelligence of the universe flows through you the same way that it flows through a caterpillar to become a butterfly the same way that it flows through a seed to become a tree, the same way that it flows through everything, it flows through you. Be open to it and let that intelligence manifest in a world of peace, of togetherness, of sustainability through you. Amazing, amazing and Mama Lee, you have the final say today as well for the young people. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what else to say after these three important points that have been left to us by Sadvi. But uh, let me also remind our youngs with three points. Number one, keep the faith that we peoples of religion, those who believe in the religion, we do believe that God is in control. So nothing happens in life, big or small, according to our judgment, except that God is in control. So everything else, COVID-19 is huge, tremendous. Many people have died. You know, you can imagine the economic uh, consequences. Many people lost their jobs. But at the end of the day, we have to believe that God is God. He's the controller of the heavens and the earth. So this is number one, keep the faith in God. Number two, that you have to have the visions of this life. What is the vision of this? Life? How do you understand? How do you define? Do you understand what is the nature of life in your understanding? This life is a place to be tested, you know, and, and we must be tested. You know, students, for example, in order for you to, to go to the next level, you have to go through examinations. Similarly with our life, in order for us to be uplifted by God, to be more honored, uh, we must go through some tests. And I think we have to take this as a part of that life's test. And not to be weak, but consider this as a challenge as a challenge. And we are strong enough to face the challenge. 
And I, 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 I challenge those who scientists, you know, luckily we have the vaccine at these days, by the way. So have the, the understanding, um, the clear definition of life, the, the vision of your life. And the last one is uh, don't lose the hope and optimism uh, because that's what faith is all about. It's about hope and optimism as we used to say that at the end of the tunnels, there will be always shining light. So um, we must be strong. We must be hopeful that we are going to go through these difficult times and challenging moments of ours. Thank you. Wow. Oh, thank you so much, Imam Ali and Safi. We, we are honestly so grateful uh, at, at YSP, of course, um, uh, that so many young people are able to hear both of your messages and and not just young people, but really this is a message for everyone as as we wrap up Interfaith Harmony Week. I, I hope we can take this time to really reflect on, on ourselves, on our lives, for example, reflect on what the true definition of peace is, right? Uh, peace externally, internally. Um, how do we practice our faith to really tie into that? And, and how can we be more harmonious and, and share that slice of pizza with a friend, right, of, of a different faith. So thank you both so much. Uh, I'd like to pass it now to uh, Naria Garter. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I guess this, um, we need to have like a virtual applause here, but it's been such an honor to have um, our moderators and also our guest speakers, Imam Ali and Sadvi. It's, been such an honor to, that you take took this time for our youth to be able to speak with our youth organization here. And definitely, as Stephanie said, we've learned so much and having both your perspectives and sharing, it's been very enlightening. And I love your analogies and also um, the practicalness as well. Like Imam Ali, you shared about, we have to really understand and practice our own religions well for those who are practicing a religious lifestyle. But also Sadvi also shared for those um, who might not be religious as well, thinking and really being open to the divine within us and that the balance, both of you mentioned the balance of religion and spirituality, um, that we really need to connect those together. So thank you. It's been very educational for um, today's session. Um, so we will now conclude and wrap up. And I believe um, Sadvi had to leave early. Um, so thank you. We'll definitely um, send um, her your questions if you have had any questions for her in the chat um, and also to Imam Ali. And we'll post those answers from them as soon as we can on our social media, Instagram and Facebook. So um, yeah, thank you everyone. And I want to also thank our co-hosts Dinner Table Talk, please check them out. Um, they have a face, um, Facebook and social media with a YouTube and Instagram um, with their podcasts. And also please check out um, International Association for Youth and Students for Peace, ysPUSA.org. All right, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful um, afternoon and evening and morning, and we will see you another time. Thank you so much. Namaste and salam alaikum. Salam, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.